All right. I think uh, while some people are popping in, I'm just going to kick it off. Um, welcome today. Um, today we're going to be talking about scaling the impact of holistic landscape restoration. Um, and let me start with introducing myself. So I'm Rose and I'm hosting today together with my colleague Zlatina. And uh, Zlatina, maybe you can unmute and say hi so that your head pops up. Uh, oh. <laughs> hi everyone. Yeah, hi. So um, Zlatina and I were both working at the knowledge education and innovation team at Commonlands. Um, and uh, together we've organized and facilitated something that we call a mountain trail, uh, which is a learning journey where we, together with our landscape partners, dive into a specific topic. And today is uh, the so-called summit of today's or of this mountain trail. Um, and um, so today we're opening up uh, this learning journey to all of you. And we're very happy to have all of you join, uh, learn together with us. Uh, I also want to introduce Milena shortly. Milena, maybe you can unmute and say hi. So people have seen your face. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. Yeah, so Milena uh, today is doing the technical support. So if you have any difficulties on the technical side, then uh, feel free to message her. Um, so yeah, let me share my screen so we can dive into it. Um, so today's going to be about scaling the impact of holistic landscape restoration. Um, and before I dive into the topic, um, let me show you the program for today. Um, so uh, today we're going to start with uh, bringing you along a bit on our journey so far. As I said, it's part of a longer learning journey for us. Um, then we'll have a presentation by Sirf Igboldes on responsible scaling. Um, and then a short break, because um, that's necessary, I think, in a long uh, Zoom meeting like this. Uh, then we will go into breakout rooms, and you'll be able to dive into one of our landscapes or multiple of our landscapes, uh, specific scaling questions or challenges. Um, then we'll come back and reflect a bit between the speakers and the breakout room facilitators. Um, and based on that, Adrian Rupke will um, uh, reflect on what he's heard today and tell us a bit about the practices to support scaling. Um, and then finally, we will uh, check out. So before I bring you along on our journey, I just want to start with already introducing our speakers to you. Um, so the first one is Sirp Wigboldes, as I said, and um, Sirp studied uh, rural socio sociology and tropical crop science. Um, and he has many uh, years of experience working in rural development projects all over the world. Um, he holds a PhD, which is actually focused on the idea and practice of scaling innovations um, for development and progress. So today he will give us a critical reflection on the concept of scaling solutions. And he will also provide us with some insights uh, on responsible scaling uh, for the context of landscape restoration. Um, then we have Adrian Rupke. Welcome. Um, and Adrian weaves networks to co-create system change and collaborate with people from diverse cultures and generations to realize a thriving world. Um, he supports leaders of collaborative efforts to widen, deepen, and lengthen their collective impacts. Um, today, he will talk about the different practices uh, that support scaling. And he is also what we call a keynote listener, um, which means that he will today be listening in. Um, and at the end of the event, he will reflect on what he has heard based on his own knowledge and background. Um, and um, yeah, he will relate that to uh, what he's going to be telling us. Um, so uh, yeah, let me take you along a little bit on our journey so far, uh, because I mentioned this is part of a longer learning journey that we've been in for the last two months with our landscape partners. So um, yeah, Commonlands is a, an, an enabler of uh, holistic landscape restoration with our uh, following our forager framework. Um, and for this, we're collaborating with uh, landscape partners all over the world. Um, and yeah, these five landscape partners um, have been working on landscape restoration for the last five to 10 years. 
And basically, they've all arrived at different uh, scaling type questions. Um, so that could mean um, how do we increase our impact geographically or how do we increase our numbers of farmers we're working with? Uh, they're very diverse questions, but they're um, common in the way that they all have to do with scaling. Um, and because of that, we um, embarked on this learning journey uh, together. Um, and that was really meant to um, explore uh, different frameworks and theories around scaling and system change together, but also to connect these really to practice, to the local context, and to see what do they mean for us? How can they help us? Um, and overall, it has been a safe place really to reflect, share, uh, learn together, um, and really explore. Um, but today uh, we're opening up to all of you to really invite you to join in our learning. Um, and we're also uh, very happy to invite you to, um, to think along with us. So um, I'm gonna go shortly over a few themes that we saw emerging um, and only shortly because after this, I'm gonna give the word to our uh, mountain trail participants of the different landscapes. And they will give some context um, on those challenges in the landscapes, which is probably more interesting than uh, these overall themes. Um, but just to give you a bit of an idea, one theme that really emerged in, in the context of scaling, um, scaling in a holistic landscape restoration uh, program is the, qu the question of quality versus quantity. So, um, for example, some of our partners are working with um, uh, farmers networks um, where they really have very tight relationships with the farmers um, and they really know each other well. What happens if you skill? Do you have to sacrifice the depth of your relationships then? Or are there other ways? Um, another theme was breaking through barriers, really breaking through systemic barriers, because we noticed that if you skill, you um, sometimes encounter certain systemic barriers, such as certain policies that don't work well, or certain uh, cultural beliefs and values. And so we've been exploring a little bit how, what, what does it really take to, to break through those systemic barriers and really create systemic change that we would like to achieve in the landscapes. Um, and finally, um, scaling in partnership, because our landscape partners are never working alone. They're always working in the landscape with different types of partners together in a partnership. Um, what does that mean for scaling? How can you um, scale, but at the same time, um, keep those partnerships uh, connected and still um, work on the same landscape vision? So I will now start introducing um, our landscapes to you, or I'll give the word to the Mountain Trail participants. And they're each going to shortly tell you a bit about um, why is scaling relevant for their landscape? at the moment, um, what have they already been doing? What are some examples? And what are their scaling challenges? Um, and I would like to ask every one of you to pay particular attention to those scaling questions or scaling ch challenges, because in the breakout rooms later, you will be able to um, dive deeper into them. You can choose which one you would like to go to, and you will also be able to think along. So um, yeah, let's dive in. Um, yeah, let's start with the Altiplano. Um, and here I can give the words to Laura Nunez, who uh, works for uh, Alvalol. Um, Laura, can I give you the word? <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm Laura Nunez, and I work in Alvelal uh, Landscape in Spain. I'm responsible of monitoring inside to the landscape, so I'm a question of data manager management. I'm going to explain a little bit uh, what happened with our process of uh, our scaling uh, today. The first question for us is what mean or what is scaling for us? And we realize that we have two levels of scaling. One is inside of, of our territory. Now it's easy to scaling in number of members inside to the association. Each month we get some members so it's not uh, very difficult to get some members, but after it's difficult to try to this member start to implement new techniques in regenerative agriculture. So due to the condition of soil, 
the weather, the rain, the culture, is we realize that it's difficult to scale in, in a quality. So for us, it's easy to scale in, in quantity, but um, it's difficult in, in quality. So also, um, we have some polarity, like uh, Ross said that about uh, quantity of quality. Sometimes we say, okay, we are going to stop <laughs> to get some more members and start to work with the members that we have. And another people think that no, it's better to get more, more uh, you, you know, more members and also try to, to work with this. And also we have an, another level of scaling in the Iberian Peninsula, exporting the Corridor framework in, in Spain. With the, uh, we developed the Alan Foundation, trying to get another landscape that uh, um, involves this uh, Foreton framework. Some example of, of scaling in Spain. Uh, we have the alveolar strategy. Inside this strategy, we have, for example, regenerative manif manifest. We create a manifest, and we are going to try to send for all the council that we have inside to the territory in the way to have more po po powerful in future politics action. So uh, with this manifest, we try, we try to have more powerful, powerful when we have um, action politics in the future. Also, uh, we make assessment, workshops, we give some funds, we teach uh, plants uh, for the farmers. And also this year, we developed a machinery sherry bank. So um, we try to facilitate the transition to some practice lending machinery to some of our members. So we have a band with some of machineries and uh, regenerative machineries and trying to uh, they start to implement some practice I uh, think thanks to these uh, machineries uh, bands. And what is our challenge? A lot, <laughs> a lot of challenge. The first, of, the first is uh, more people doing regenerative agriculture that they said before, that is uh, for the culture, for the weather, for the soil, it's not easy that the people start uh, changing the techniques and uh, the techniques. So it's not um, easy that the farmer implement uh, the regenerative agriculture. Also, we have to redefine of our regenerative, regenerative agriculture concept because sometimes we have uh, a lot of members, more than 400 members. Some of them trying to regenerative agriculture is one thing, another member saying that regenerative agriculture is another thing. So we, one, uh, one big challenge is try to put all these polarities uh, in a, one part and try to redefine what is relative agriculture for alveolar. Also have a common vision for working a scaling strategy. Some of our members think that we have to do everything. So alveolar, trust in alveolar. So alveolar technician or alveolar have to do things, but we are now bigger. And sometimes it's not easy to do everything. So some of our uh, another members think that we need to support to another entities trying to scale in, in another way. So we have also this polarity between the people that think that Abela has to do most of the, the things because we know we, we have experience, we know the, that correct things about agriculture and another polarity that thinks that we have to support in a network community and trying to work with this. So we have also this polarity inside our association. Also, the governance, um, for the beginning, we have uh, not too much people, and uh, we have uh, not too many people, but we really involved, you know? you know? So these people um, are in the position, some positions in different uh, association business case. So we have to try to, uh, with this governance, to get improve uh, our systems. And the last one is, Influencing in agriculture uh, politics, uh, 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 influencing of agriculture politics. The majority of our members in COM is the European subvention because one year we have frozen, another year we have dried. So some year they don't have production and they don't have income for the production. The only income is the subvention most of this year. So. If the European politics asks to the farmers to change 
some practices they are going to do for sure because they need that subvention. So if we have a very big scaling in Spain, we try to, to work with this cap or politics, European politics common, uh, trying to, they ask to the farmer, improve the techniques, into the technicians or, or improve the regenerative techniques. This, this is not easy because there is a lobby with a, a, a very powerful business uh, in another part of Spain that they don't want to change that practice. They want to get the ecological subvention doing nothing. So they are very pressured between some uh, uh, lobby for, for business that they don't want to this chain of practice. So more or less, that's, uh, I don't know if it's <laughs> clear. Thank you so much. That's very okay. clear. We'll move on to India. And here I can invite Harma to, uh, to tell us a bit about the scaling situation. Uh, Harma, can I give you the word? Uh, you're still muted. So can you unmute yourself? Yes. 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 <laughs> Hello. Hello to everybody. So here's a large group of participants, uh, really lovely. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Harma. Um, I'm a, a landscape manager at uh, Commonland and uh, as such uh, in charge for the program uh, in India together with my colleagues uh, Tom, Tom Davis and, uh, and uh, Shekhar Kolipaka and of course with our partners uh, in the landscape. Uh, and I know that uh, Sumya, he's, uh, he's also participating today and uh, Deepak is participating today and maybe others as well. I haven't seen them, but uh, yeah, so we are here with a, with a large uh, group of representatives of the India landscape. Um, in India here, uh, we... We are have a, a you see in the on the on the picture a small dot. That's our uh, landscape where we are working in central India in the state of Chhattisgarh. Um, we have we started working in Chhattisgarh only uh, uh, four four years ago with a, with a scouting in the landscape, finding where we would like to work, where we could work, and we decided on on this uh, uh, piece of. Uh, yeah, this landscape of around, it's now around 200,000 hectare, hectares. We have done scoping in 2019 and also uh, further scoping uh, this year. And then uh, we agreed with uh, stakeholders from, uh, from the government, uh, rural enterprises and our uh, local partners and uh, other uh, CSOs on, on this uh, uh, lands the landscape boundaries. Uh, in Chhattisgarh, and it's a landscape of uh, around 200,000 hectares. It's a sub uh, watershed which drains into, well, which flows uh, ultimately to, into one of the largest rivers uh, in India, the Mahanadi River, which uh, has its uh, delta uh, in, at the eastern side, so in the, in the Bay of Bengal. Um, so with our landscape, why scaling? So we started, in two, as I said, in 2019 with uh, scouting and scoping the program. We started with implementation in two pilot sites in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the hills. Um, and there we started, and there our implementing partner is uh, Samet, a local organization. And uh, with them, we started in uh, small, small scale with regard uh, on uh, sustainable livelihoods depending on forest resources and small scale uh, agriculture. So that, this is in the hill areas of, of the landscape. And besides the hill areas, we also have now started working in uh, the plains areas, which is more um, uh, yeah, focusing on, on small scale agriculture and commercial agriculture with regard to uh, uh, paddy cultivation and uh, sugarcane cultivation. Um, why scaling? Well, as I said, uh, um, um, 
Scaling is important because the zones, the hills are is a forested area with small scale agriculture and the economic zone is, a, is a, an agricultural area, uh, both small scale and uh, uh, commercial and with also with large uh, uh, settlements, small towns. Why scaling is important? Because the zones are interconnected. Uh, water from the hills flows to the, to the, to the plains. Uh, there is a, there is a, uh, we see a lot of water, uh, yeah, water um, stress. Um, there's a overview, uh, yeah, uh, water tables are uh, decreasing. So that that's one of the re uh, one of the points that is connecting the the bigger landscape that is water management, um, and um, uh, so, so so that's for scaling out to a larger area. With the community, we are working in the hills already with the communities, starting on pilots, as I said, for a forest dependent. Uh, 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 livelihoods, um, meaning that the uh, we want together with the with the communities uh, do community managed forest restoration, and the communities are working on examples like uh, uh, seed seed bowls. So they collect seeds, process seeds, put them in uh, seed bowls, in mud bowls, and bring these back, throw these back into the into the, the forest. That's one example of regenerative uh, forest. Uh, Wait, uh, quick. Uh, uh, oh, my, uh, we're running a little over time. Yeah. Could you maybe uh, uh, focus on your challenge, and then you can explain yeah. the breakout room. Yeah. Thanks. So, so, so th these are uh, small, small examples that can be replicated by communities. And uh, what I would uh, like to uh, say with regard to the challenges, well, we are now working with more and more partners because we are scaling to a larger landscape. So, a challenge is how to build a coalition of partners, uh, not being uh, um, and uh, having all these partners coming to a joint goal, let's say the joint vision that we want to uh, create for this uh, landscape. And, uh, and this vision is uh, important because that will also guide us in developing a, a long, longer term plan, landscape plan in which we also want to get the other stakeholders, the government and, and uh, agro uh, uh, agribusinesses uh, uh, on board. So how do we create this buy-in? so that we can work on the, this uh, large-scale landscape restoration. And what is really important, you work with people. So to get these people on board, to get them along with you, partners, communities, but also the other stakeholders like the government, you need, how do we um, uh, create their buy-in? But it also means, how do you convince them how to, what does it mean for change? Because mindset change is really important. So how, how do you work on that? Thank you, Norman. And, yeah, okay. That's, <laughs> Sorry. that's the main challenge. Yeah, yeah. We can go into the rest in the breakout rooms. Um, for the next speakers, um, just a um, friendly uh, request, if you could maybe keep it within three minutes, and then we can um, dive into the rest of the landscapes in the breakout rooms. We will have plenty of time there. Um, so now we'll move on to the uh, Pavianskloof Langloof, and Bas is going to uh, tell us a little bit about this. Um, Bas, can I give you the word? Yep, thanks. And uh, Liz sends her apologies. She can't make it. She's got some people visiting the landscape today uh, that she has to show around. Uh, so she uh, sends her apologies. Um, I'm going to rep, try and represent uh, the Bavianska of Langlove landscape best I can. Um, we are in South Africa uh, on the border of the Western Cape and the Eastern Cape, as you can see in the picture. Um, it's quite a unique landscape in that it has uh, an intersection of three uh, very unique uh, ecosystems endemic to South Africa, which is nowhere else in the world with high level of endemic species. And it's also the cross uh, crossing between two different uh, global diversity hotspots. Um, uh, they living lands have been working in this area since 2008, so already quite a little bit longer than uh, uh, Commonland has existed. And we joined them uh, and started working together in 2013, 2014. 
Uh, so we've uh, known each other for a long time. We've learned a lot together. Um, and scaling came is relevant to this landscape because of a few things. Um, uh, chief of which is that in the Bavianus Clove, especially, but also in the Lung Clove, it's not very densely populated. So for some activities to make sense, like building up a team for regeneration, uh, physical regeneration work in the landscape, or working with value chains like for mohair or for uh, meat, uh, there's just not enough volume to justify the, the cost or the uh, investment in building up such a team. So to be able to do that work, which still needs to happen, it's important to start scaling up and looking at uh, uh, significantly larger areas. So I think it's going to be about four or five times the size of what you see in the, in the picture currently. Um, we've been in these conversations for the past couple, two years to uh, figure out sort of what the area should be and how to get ready. Uh, scaling to such a, a, a new level is a really different way of working, a different kind of organization that you need, a different kind of mindset that you need. It's not just growing what you're already doing. Uh, we've been trying to build that as well in the past few years, but we also realize we need to start working with more partner organizations in that area. A couple of the challenges that we are facing uh, are around how do we continue focusing on the work that needs to happen in these landscapes that we committed to for 20 years. Uh, so how do we not drop it and uh, drop these whilst focusing on the new shiny stuff? Uh, uh, what exactly will we be scaling? What's going to be the difference, uh, the different mindset? What's going to be uh, things that we do want to keep because they have worked uh, for us in the past? How do we uh, make that decision? And um, yeah, also a little bit what does scaling mean in this, this context? And how does weaving come in? Uh, also, in sort of a new word. Sometimes we've seen articles around: is we weaving the new scaling? Is it a buzzword or not? What does it mean? So we're uh, in the past two years we've been already trying to build that process uh, or build that mindset, but uh, also running into challenges in terms of how do you build the organizational capacity to scale um, on a shoestring budget? Uh, because funders more and more uh, or less and less are willing to give funding for Capacity development uh, funders also tend to now start giving too little money for the projects that uh, are need to, need to be executed uh, with an eye to leverage co-funding. Uh, but that means that there's very little funding left to actually building more and more capacity in the organization and some breathing space to focus on these changes. So this is some of the stuff we'll be talking about in our breakout group. Thank you, Bas. Great, very clear. Um, so now we're going to be moving on to Keith, um, who's going to tell us something about Southwest Australia. Um, Keith, can I give you the word? And again, <laughs> a kind of reminder yeah. to uh, keep it within three minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Rose. Uh, in the Southwest region of Australia, we're not the only agency that working in the same space for four returns. There's probably five different agencies focused on different aspects of the four returns. Our focus is really around natural capital. So why scaling? Um, there's 28 million hectares of land and which has been cleared over the last 200 years. Um, that's 90%, which is a, quite devastating really because that has uh, contributed to a rapid decline in rainfall, the drawdown of natural capital. And because it's a very old landscape in the first place, one of the oldest on the planet, there wasn't a lot of natural capital there in the first place. So we're drawing down a, that natural capital far greater rate than we are restoring it. So you can see in the top right hand picture the, the extent of land clearing and that's um, endemic across the whole southwest region. And um, the bottom left hand picture is salt affected land and so of that 28 million hectares we have probably seven or eight million hectares that are now unproductive from land management practices and that. And the bottom right hand picture is we are um, we export a lot of natural capital. So we export around 15 million tonnes of wheat alone each year. So that's in essence, exporting natural capital. So the scaling is around, we have um, say 7,000 farmers in that region. Of that 7,000, maybe 5% um, have adopted regenerative agriculture to the extent that it can be adopted at this point in time, given um, our knowledge of it. Um, and there's a lot of other interested farmers, but the scaling is, 
getting that 5%, that 95%, um, that's what we want to do in that whole Southwest Land Division. Um, so one of the barriers and pathways forward is <coughs> natural capital accounting to verify how sustainable land management practice is. So we're doing that. Um, the landscape scale plan, which we're going to be doing in common land and quite a few other agencies. <coughs> More involvement with the First Nation community. And one of the main challenges is how do we transition from individual towards collective impact while at the same time having um, more open, honest conversations with mainstream farmers about how business as usual is leading to what you see in the picture on the left-hand side. And also with the First Nation people who were the original custodians of the land and how they can be more involved in how we restore that landscape. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. That's uh, very interesting questions that we can dive into. And then our final landscape already, uh, which is of peat meadows in the Netherlands. Um, and I think I can give the word to Matthijs, just checking if that's right. Yes, you're correct. Great. Um, <laughs> good morning, everybody. I'm uh, Matthijs, uh, program lead of um, regenerative agriculture for Weiland. Um, a brief introduction to the landscape. It's uh, it's the it's um, yeah the peat meadow landscape surrounding Amsterdam, The Hague, and Rotterdam. Um, primarily use is uh, dairy, um, intensive dairy farming systems. It's not as intensive as the rest of the Netherlands, but still, it's not sustainable for the landscape. And the main uh, challenge in this landscape is actually to yeah transition farmers into more nature inclusive regenerative uh, farming practices um and over the last five years we've uh, managed to grow a network of uh, 200 farmers uh and yeah do all sorts of pilots and projects with them and uh yeah also help discover what regenerative agriculture in this landscape might look like um and these 200 farmers represent I think 10% of the uh, total amount of farmers in this landscape. And uh, we've set ourselves the ambitions in the, in the next five year strategy to reach a thousand farmers um, or yeah, more or less half of the farmer population within the landscape really to, um, to break the trend and to uh, yeah, make sure that, that regenerative agriculture becomes the norm in this landscape. However, we've um, also, yeah, made ourselves sort of the, the the condition that we don't want to grow uh, Vailand into a tenfold as big organization um, because it's a crowded landscape with lots of organizations and, and local parties who are very capable perhaps of uh, doing this work and where there's already sort of existing uh, networks and um, the facilitation. Um, and therefore, yeah, that is our sort of our main challenge. And I, I needed to pick one sort of example where there's a challenge. And therefore, I, I picked the example of the Boeremeiser, which is sort of a, a sort of a farmer index, which we have developed as a learning tool for farmers. Uh, maybe, oh, she can go to the next slide. Um, uh, this was yeah one of the, the, the score, sort of scaling instruments we've developed or used. Um, uh, what it does, it, it on a farm level, um, it 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 is is um, it's an index or a guidance on how you can score or develop towards regenerative agriculture, or more or less on a four returns on your farm. So, what can you do for natural capital, financial capital, social capital, and inspiration? Uh, and here you can score bronze, silver, and gold. And uh, so you you as a farmer. Can really see okay where am i currently at and you can also set ambitions for example i want to grow from from uh bronze uh herb rich grasslands into gold uh, herb rich grasslands and if we know that the farmer has this ambition we can then sort of sort of very good connect him to either one of our projects or another organization who is supporting farmers on this theme um so yeah we use it for several ways it's mainly a, a, currently mainly a learning tool uh, for the farmer network which also sort of standardizes and automates our work because uh, until now the work was very labor intensive a lot of kitchen table con conversations a lot of data uh questionnaires which we now try to sort of automate through surveys and connections to other databases um 
and which we hope to use to to collaborate with with also other organizations. However, there are also some challenges around this this um, Boerewijzer thing because one of the yeah key questions currently is is there is a potential to also use this instrument as uh, as the basis to to do um, payment for ecosystem services uh, systems so that you can yeah let farmers be financially rewarded if they yeah make steps from bronze to to gold or whatever on certain themes. However, that also means that we as Weiland yeah get a completely different position towards farmers because instead of being more or less of the doctor we now would then move into being the policeman because um yeah the higher you score the higher your reward will be um yeah but farmers are asking for it and so this is a challenge should we do this or not or yeah are there ways around it um, maybe by yeah, um, initiating a cooperation of farmers uh, about this. Um, and also in collaborating with others, a big challenge is how can you let them embrace your philosophy or like this instrument? Every uh, organization, of course, has its own identity and working methods, and um, you don't want to push it to them, but yeah, hope to inspire them to to see what what it might do for their own organization or in other ways sort of integrate with their work methods um but it's more or less also yeah how do you collaborate with others um whilst sort of yeah keeping your own identity and yeah respecting also uh, each other's identity um yeah I, I would leave it there thanks so much Matthijs that's very interesting. Um, so now that you all got an, uh, an introduction to the landscapes, um, uh, you know uh, maybe already which breakout room you might want to join. Um, but first, we will go to a uh, presentation by Sirp. Um, I've already introduced you, Sirp, so I think uh, we can dive straight into your presentation. So I'm going to stop sharing um, so you can uh, share your screen. Okay. So. I'll see if I can get this started. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's working. Uh, and I need to put it in the slideshow. Let's see if this works. Can you see? Uh, maybe I need to do this. Um, I think it may be loading still. Is it? Uh, it's not visible like this. Yeah, we do. Uh, we do see a slide, but not in the slideshow. Um, okay. Mode. Uh, then I think this should be normally. Uh, uh, Someone uh, put it in play mode. What does that mean? Um, uh, well, otherwise I, I I better just oh display setting. I, I think I need to go to duplicate. I think that's what I need to do. Is this better? Yes. Yeah, it's working. Thanks. Okay. For okay. So um, yes, uh, thank you for the opportunity to share some some uh, thoughts and ideas, suggestions, and I'll be throwing on the table just a, a, a variety of of ideas in the beginning, especially some more critical reflections, and later also trying to think along with uh, the task uh, that you have ahead in, in relation to your landscapes. Um, so first of all, uh, basically, um, I, I already heard it, uh, some of you mention about like, what exactly do we want to scale? But I also think there's the question of what do we actually mean when we use the whole word scaling? And I would suggest that there's, a, there's, there's much more behind this wor uh, word scaling. Uh, and it comes from a background that it will be good to to unpack before you uh, use the word and also maybe to think whether it is, it is a useful word at all. Why do we use it? Are we just uh, using a popular uh, framing or is, is there really some content to it? Or are there maybe better words that we can, can use? Um, sorry, I'll just go back. I, I, think, I think why it's uh, become popular to frame things in terms of scaling, which was not the case as much when we go like uh, 10, 20 years ago, 
because there's this idea of ascending, going up, it's better scaling. You know, if we have something we like, uh, if we scale it, it only becomes better, it goes up. And I think there's some, some concerns as well that I want to quickly dive into. First of all, um, I think there's, there's a kind of a scaling, what I would call scaling rhetoric, like, you know, uh, if we scale these innovations of these or these practices, we think it's, it's wonderful, that will solve our challenges. Uh, as, as a statement, whether it's it's uh, um, evidence based or not, but but uh, just as a, a a way of approaching things, and even maybe deeper, scaling innovations is good. Uh, what I would call that like, you have a pro innovation bias, but you call it, you call it a pro uh, scaling bias. The idea that if we have something great, an innovation or or, or anything that we like, if we scale this, um, it is good by definition, and even maybe deeper, uh, that that how we run our societies, that it's it's very much based on this idea of scaling generalizable solutions. I'll dive a bit deeper into it, uh, where we make a, a number of selections in what we think will solve our, our, our challenges. And that's how we achieve development and progress. Uh, and I think there's an, uh, really a problem in this. Because I think this scaling, it is not a neutral term. It's very well to think about whether you really want to jump on the bandwagon of scaling things. Because in, in, in how, how you see it uh, applied in, in many contexts, it, it essentially also means getting more of the same. Uh, because you make a selection and, and in scaling, you get more of that. And consequently, often less of something else. It has become. Uh, connected to the word solutions, I've come to become a bit allergic to this whole term of solutions, as if a solution can be something you have on the shelf. Uh, whereas I would say a solution only becomes a solution when once it has solved something for someone somewhere. Um, but you hear lots of people talk about we have solutions for this and we have solutions for that um, prior to it having solved something in a particular context. So. They have to be careful about using that, that kind of word, I would say. But anyway, if you if you look around just in the newspapers, in, in literature, you'll see it everywhere. Uh, this solution stock and solutions to be often even in these terms of massively scaled because this is the answer to our problems. Um, so I, I would I would argue that actually in, in effect, what you're doing is the complexity and diversities, and certainly that 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 uh, applies to landscapes. That uh, it, in effect, in scaling, you easily oversimplify things and you uh, reduce it to a level of simplicity that's not uh, helpful. Uh, we see it happen uh, all around. I would argue in energy uh, transitions, we see electric cars, windmills, and solar panels. That those are the solutions to be scaled. And that will solve our challenges uh, in climate change. It's CO2 emissions and carbon sequestration. You know, that's the solution. Or even in, in uh, recently in relation to, uh, to uh, COVID, uh, if only we have these corona injections, that's the solution. And I think the world uh, is a little bit more complex, fortunately, than that. But this is a, a tendency we see in society to reduce things to. Um, a number of, of um, um, oops, now it gets frozen. Uh, yeah, oh, there it goes. And so this, this, this is the kind of pattern that we see where uh, in diversity, when we scale, we get more of the same. We have selected solutions, so to speak, uh, uh, to, to be scaled. We lose diversity. And not only that, we lo we lose resilience, and and we'll get get back to that uh, in a moment because diversity is also one of the, the characteristics of of um, uh, one of the resilience characteristics. So again, it's it's not it's something to be thought about carefully when we talk uh, think about scaling and, and how to approach it in relation to for returns landscapes. Um, restoration, I would say, would, is often also about scaling down certain things because 
uh, in the past, we, I saw the example of, of Australia, uh, uh, a number of things have gone wrong and maybe certain practices have to be rather scaled down and it's about restoring proportionality that things uh, become more balanced again. Uh, and it may be less about scaling up certain things and more uh, needs to be about scaling down certain other things. Um, so um, we also have to be careful about, uh, we used to have these ideas of blueprint approaches, but this is the way to do it, um, a kind of a factory method, uh, because basically underpinning industrialization and homogenization of society, uh, this, the, the McDonaldization of society, as it's sometimes called, it's about the selection. This is the way how we eat. This is the way how we do things and do it all over the world. And we get a less, less uh, diverse world. And that's, it's more of a factory method of, of, of development, I would say. Also, um, increased uniformity, which, which can be, uh, which is often the result of scaling innovations, tends to play into the hands of the powerful. Um, I, I won't go into that uh, more deeply now. There, there's a whole world behind that. Um, often the scaling becomes a purpose in itself rather than a means. Um, so in the beginning, it's the scaling is, is about the impact behind it, but, but then the means that which you want to see go to scale becomes the focus. I've seen it happen in many uh, organizations that I, I, I've worked with, that it kind of replaces the higher goal and easily it becomes like an automatic pilot. Like, uh, you know, we, we selected some things that we think are great and, and then just roll those out. Uh, there's also a rollout, this, this language comes from scaling. Uh, whereas we sometimes we need to just be continuously creative and, and not, not select some things to be scaled, but, but continue creativity also in a new context. So, you know, just, just as an example, let, let me not go into it too deep, but this, this idea of generalizable solutions uh, that's very much behind this, this whole idea of, of, of scaling. And also this idea that I just mentioned, uh, if, we, if we think pilots are um, helpful, why, why think about rolling out, so to speak, uh, the pilot and do things the same way? Why not do more pilots? You could also, why, why not frame it in terms of doing more pilots rather than scaling uh, the pilot? Um, just to visualize things, uh, you know, the, the scaling can mean uh, it's selective scaling that we lose diversity from, from this, basically uh, the, the Australian landscape, thinking of that one, maybe it resembles a bit this, this is maybe how it was, and this is what you get. Or this is another way of visualizing it, the distortions uh, that, that can happen because we pull things out of proportion, certain things become more, and consequently other things less. We, we rarely think about when you scale one thing, uh, it, it, there's some other thing scaling as well. Uh, as well. It's, it's, it's not as if you can have more. It, 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 there's, um, it, it, it happens uh, interactively. Uh, excessive scaling, well, this is a picture from RLC in, in Asia, uh, uh, scaling uh, uh, irrigation and draining a whole uh, huge, lake and this has happened in more locations like in Ethiopia. And this is often what happens we have this idea of that this is we have this wonderful thing that we want to see uh, scale and then but at some point you get escalating negative effects there's it, it works up to a certain level if 10 farmers do something it can be great even 100 but when a thousand or ten thousand start doing the same thing for instance using certain water resources then you get a whole different picture. But often this monitoring what happens, you know, anticipating what if this goes to scale, uh, it rarely happens. So uh, this is, a, uh, you know, the, the, the well-known uh, African saying, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. You may uh, apply this to the idea of if you want to have more of the same, uh, you know, then scaled selected solutions. But if you want diversity, maybe apply diversity at scale as a thought. Well, let me skip this to uh, go a bit faster. I, I, I like this one I came uh, across the other day. 
maybe you've seen it before, um, still the use of the word solutions, uh, which I would prefer otherwise, but, but I like the, the integrated uh, approach and, and, and perspective on the things that need to start moving, whereas we see there's a focus like on, on the wind turbines and, and some other things, and that's, that's um, zoomed out. But here I found out like how refrigerants, how big of a, a role they play, for instance. And, and we see this in, in, in many places. We want to make a complex world and, and complex challenges. We want to reduce them to two or three solutions. Um, it, it, it's not how it works. It's just not how it works. Uh, this is from a study in China of, on, on rubber cultivation in, in Shishabana, Southwest China. And, and we analyzed you know, the, the kind of simultaneously happening uh, scaling processes and how they interact. So when we talk about scaling, this is not about like one thing that we work on uh, that goes to scale. We operate in a, a constantly scaling environment. Uh, hey, it's about tourism going up and, and uh, getting reduced, uh, uh, Sweden agriculture going down, crop diversity going down, soil erosion going up. Uh, food self-sufficiency going down. Uh, there's all sorts of things scaling. So we don't start scaling something in a sort of vacuum, but we start scaling in a constantly scaling world. And it's good to be aware of how what you would like to see go to scale uh, connects to those other things. Uh, so yeah, you know, this we, we like to have switches on and off, uh, turn the solution on uh, at scale. But maybe uh, like a sound mixer is, is a better metaphor of, of, of what we need to be dealing uh, with. And, and nature is also, it's, it's fine, a fine tuned system on. And maybe we start to uh, need to start thinking also less in terms of like scaling innovation, scaling products, scaling uh, uh, yeah, solutions, but scaling justice, scaling care, more principles and, and, and good values which then can be expressed through products, uh, services, and, 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 and certain uh, appliance uh, applications. Uh, but thinking in terms of, of scaling principles and, and, and more the higher goals, and then consider, okay, if this is what we want to see happen, what, how does that translate to concrete uh, well, innovations or, or, or applications, uh, products, uh, et cetera? Um, um, and also, okay, so I've, I've said that maybe we shouldn't be looking at, at generalizable solutions, but maybe there are certain generalizable design and application principles and purposes that to learn from. So in, in what you like in your landscapes and what you'd like to see go to scale, it's, it's good to unpack sort of like what's, what's the specific thing that we like in here, the, 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 the principles, um, the values, um, and the, the ways of doing things, approaches, and then repackage them uh, towards uh, adaptive, uh, this kind of adaptive scaling. Uh, do it in different ways. Maybe you work with that potential in, in that um, in, in, in that uh, print, the application of that principle, but by all means repackage it towards new context, context conditions instead of doing like uh, cut and paste, like oh, the, uh, uh, more how it got applied. Um, because in a, in a new context, it may need to be adjusted a bit, where basically you follow the same kind of principles, but it's, it, it looks differently in, in, in application. Uh, so this, I like this, this saying from uh, Antoni Gaudi, uh, copiers do not collaborate, collaborate. So if he, he wanted people to think along with him, not just to say, oh, tell us what to do and then just do it, but he wanted them to, to think along. And in, in, Scaling, we easily we lose that kind of, 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 of the creativity to collaborate and find new ways forward instead of just rolling out what we had. Um, so maybe uh, I move a bit on looking at things. So well, in terms of scaling in, in for the for returns landscapes, um, looking at those four returns, you know, so maybe it's about scaling, you know, giving people hope and a sense of purpose, and you, you know them better than I, bringing back jobs, etc. So that's maybe where you want to look at, like, how could that happen in more places for more people? 
as a starting point. Um, and also, I think I may have said it already before, um, but think of also not using the word scaling. Try to use other words instead, because there's a lot behind scaling, what you mean, exactly mean by it. So try to make your case, seeing things applied more uh, widely, etc. but using a different word. Uh, that, that sometimes helps you to be uh, more uh, concrete on, uh, in, in what you mean. Um, well, also, also uh, it, it relates to the earlier picture. When you want to scale a particular thing that was here about uh, the use of high quality cassava peel, which usually was just rotting uh, next to the road, uh, environmental hazard, etc. cetera. Um, when we thought about like, how could this be uh, used uh, more at scale? Then we saw that there's all sorts of things that would need to start scaling. It, it, it's rarely is it, or actually never this one focal thing, but there's a whole uh, world around it in which things will start to need to start moving. So when we think about scaling resilience, uh, maybe that's a, a, an interesting thought I already mentioned. It's about scaling diversity, about creating buffers, flexibility, robustness, connectedness. Uh, maybe paying some attention to what happens to to these resilience characteristics uh, uh, characteristics as things scale. May uh, want to start thinking in terms of a theory of scaling or how you think scaling can happen in relation to what you want to focus on. You may want to think in terms of leverage points, maybe reaching deeper leverage points in, in terms of seeing things change. Um, there's a whole uh, idea behind it. Lifana University has done some great work on this. So if you want to delve deeper into this, it's how you could see change happen um, that you would like to see happen. Sometimes you're pushing on things that really don't help things start moving. And, and, and this, may, this may be a way, way of scaling your, your impact as well. Uh, becoming partners in scaling, I've done a study also on, on collective capabilities on how you can partner to have a, a range of capabilities uh, to, to help um, yes, scaling work for sustainable development and for, for, for holistic landscape restoration. Um, well, I maybe skip this. This is more perspective on, on the kind of processes from a living lab perspective. And here's some background reading if you'd like to uh, delve deeper into these kind of thoughts. So I think I should stop there and I, I stay within the 20 minutes and then maybe open the floor for some questions. I'll stop sharing then. Let me see how I do that. Actually, um, what we are going to propose to do now is because this was a lot of information and a lot of different perspectives about the different landscapes, about frameworks and tools that can help us think about scaling differently, what SERP suggested. So what we are going to invite you to do is to take actually a very short two minute break. And then we will go into the breakout rooms and have conversations there with the invitation that Serb and Adrian are actively engaged and also walking around the breakout room. So you can also have a little bit of conversations there um, as well. From the perspective of our landscapes, what makes sense, what still questions they have, what do they resonate with from uh, what you shared, Serb? So that's how we are going to do this. But first, let's take a very short two minute break. So everybody, um, Go stretch a, a little bit, get a glass of water, and uh, we'll start again in six minutes past the hour. I hope that works with all the time zones <laughs> that are present in, um, in here. I'm not quite sure, but two minutes and then we continue. Okay. I hope you had some time to stretch a little bit. Um, and now we have some time to actually go into breakout rooms, 
and uh, start dissecting a little bit all of the things we heard in the past, past hour. One of the things that Serp said was collaborate and think along. And that's exactly what we are uh, hoping to do now is to, um, instead of figuring out how can we scale all of our landscapes in the exact same way, we actually want to capitalize on the um, knowledge and experience and different ideas and perspectives of over 50 people in this conversation right now and um, see what kind of suggestions you guys have on um, how our landscapes can address some of the challenges that they have shared with you. So I'm going to share my screen just for a second to show you how this is going to work. Uh, second. OK, so we'll invite the landscapes in the breakout rooms to introduce very briefly again What's their context? What's their challenge? Maybe reflect a little bit on how what they heard from SERP makes sense in their context and in terms of their uh, questions they have. And you can choose which landscape to join. And you can also choose to hop in and out of a few um, in the span of this uh, breakout session. So you have an option in Zoom to, to do that, to just choose where to be in. And our invitation for everybody is to contribute and share as much as possible ideas, perspectives, suggestions, reflections, um, and to really listen for the potential that you hear in this landscape. What is there that might be a very good idea? What is from your experience that might be helpful um, experiment for that landscape to try out? Um, and really, how does the story um, of the landscape connect to some of the things that you have experience with? So here are some kind of principles for you to follow. And one request is to be helpful to the landscapes. Maybe in the breakouts, we'll see how many people there are, but you will have opportunity to speak up, unmute, uh, talk to the landscapes, talk to a little bit uh, Serp and Adrian if they're also in the room. And Serb and Adrian uh, are also very welcome to bring in their reflection also from their perspectives uh, into the different um, conversations. But we have a Google Doc that um, we want to use uh, to document some of your uh, suggestions and reflections. And we'll post that document in the chat. And there, please add all the resources, suggestions, and ideas that come to mind. So even if you're not talking, you can really help out by taking notes for um, the conversation that you're witnessing with some ideas and suggestions that you see. Um, I think that's it. We Oh, I'm going to share my screen again just to remind you the, the, uh, the different challenges, the different landscapes. Um, so we have Altiplano is... Oh, I cannot pronounce that, Altiplano in Spain. So we have there a lot of people doing regenerative culture or interested in membership, but uh, less applying governance, influencing ag agricultural policies, a common vision for working on scaling um, and also evaluation. In India, we have the question, what may be effective ways to set goals among diverse stakeholders and change mindsets and habits at the landscape level? In South Africa, the range of level of expertise required are not viable at the current scale. How can we transition to in economies of scale instead? Australia, transitioning from individual impact towards collective impact and difficult conversations about the history of the landscape to create a better future for all. In the Netherlands, we don't want to grow violent tenfold. So how do we increase our impact through collaboration with others? Should we develop into PES or not? How do you let others embrace your work? What can and cannot be standardized? So we'll open the breakout rooms. 
you will have about 20, um, 25 minutes, maybe 20 uh, in the breakout rooms to have some conversations and interactions with the people from the landscapes there. And then we'll come back together to close together with Adrian and some reflections uh, from his perspective. We are slowly coming back together. Yeah, I was ch trying to change uh, um, breakout room, but I cannot join anymore, I think. No, we, uh, we have closed the breakout rooms now. Uh, I know this has been just the beginning. Some of the conversations were really just uh, starting to get interesting. Um, and of course, we would love to create more opportunities like that to, to have a bit more interaction with uh, our landscapes and share these collective insights um, and also capitalize on the wonderful for returns community that we have because there is so much richness and experience in here. Um, what we are going to do now is um, just for a brief one kind of sentence uh, insight from uh, our four breakout rooms. Um, I would like to hear from uh, the people who led the conversations there. Um, just one thing that came up for you uh, in, in that conversation that you are taking with you into the landscape. We cannot, of course, summarize everything, but you can look at the Google Doc. Some of the landscapes were very active taking notes there. Some of you might uh, have other kind of insights, but from each of the people, uh, just one sentence, what's the main insight you're taking from the conversation? And let's start with Matthijs and the Netherlands. Uh, thank you for always thinking of something challenging. Um, I would say uh, principles for collaboration. Okay, um, that can mean a lot of things, so I'm curious what it is. Um, from Australia, Keith. Oh, Keith is not... Is oh, yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, principles of collaboration is the problem. Problems we all face are very similar. It doesn't matter what the scale. Um, so, so how we we can work collectively on addressing some of those issues, which is what we're doing today. Um, then Tom, what about South Africa? Oh, uh, sorry, India. <laughs> I must admit to joining the South African breakup group initially as well, so I also get confused. Um, difficult to answer in such a short time, but um, certainly a reoccurring trend within India is uh, the governance systems and how do we organize these uh, complicated relationships in ways that can facilitate scaling. Mm -hmm. um, and then also from the earlier presentation, maybe not everything needs to be scaled. It's, it's really about selecting uh, those critical points, I guess, and maybe even scaling down in some senses. Mm -hmm. Okay, now bus in South Africa. <laughs> Tom is actually from South Africa, so actually in South Africa yeah. as well at the moment. So I, uh, I saw, see the confusion. Um, um, we talked about uh, a few different things. Uh, I think it's also, uh, we found it also a bit challenging to uh, zoom into the specific context of South Africa, or in this case, the South African landscape in a few minutes, and then, uh, then uh, talk about the, the scaling challenges going forward uh, with specific sort of advice or tips. Um, but we talked a lot about uh, different, or we need to work with different organizations and what building on what Sierpa also said, building resilience in the system uh, of existing organizations in that area. So working with each other to build that resilience and not focus on a few solutions uh, is one of the things we'll take away from that. Mm. Thanks. And Luis, what about Spain? 
Um, so I will summarize it in two. So it's uh, how can we maybe promote instant remunerations because it's easier for farmers to adopt that because money is a big, it's, a, it's something very important for them. And the communication about the real effects of, of what we are, what's happening in the world. Maybe we have over information about climate change, for example, but maybe they just see it as a drought. So more on how is that related? A drought to the management and everything so they can adopt more regenerative practices because they own the information. Um, wonderful. So if we had more time to discuss, it would be uh, great to also have some more conversation with SERP. But we have another very exciting um, speaker or as we said, keynote listener, and that's Adrian. Um, who is going to close off this event with some reflections also from his um, experience and expertise. I've known him for a few years now, and last year I joined an amazing learning journey with him, which was called Indigenous and Modern. And it was a beautiful weaving, weaving uh, connection experience between how do we use systems thinking to change systems and how can we use Indigenous wisdom uh, to also reconnect to uh, what has been working in our lands for many years. And to me, that was really a, an eye-opening experience in terms of how can we better care for our communities and for our lands. And this is why I'm very excited to hear what he has to share with us um, now. And uh, yeah, for the rest of the session, um, Adrian, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you so much. Uh... Satina, and I'm glad that the inspiration still reverberates and that um, you invited me here to this amazing event. And yeah, when Rose in the preparation, uh, she mentioned this this idea of keynote listener. I wasn't I wasn't aware of that um, before, but I I felt I was really coming alive because I really like to I like to listen. Um, so I would like to give some some mirrors of what I've been been sensing in the group and what's been happening and. Um, I want to start off with something that's maybe beyond the, the content, so something that's more subtle, but I feel like is shared in this group, which is a deep uh, dedication and a deep motivation to create um, more regenerative practices and to really work with the land, to work with people. And I say this because it fills my heart and it inspires me and gives me hope for the future that all of us here are actually dedicated to, to do this work in our own unique ways. And what I also saw as a similarity is that all of us were taking a very collaborative approach. I often heard these words from different landscapes of facilitating, weaving, collaboration, and really doing things together, because I think we've all realized that the challenges that we're facing is nothing to be faced alone as an individual or even as one organization. So we need these kind of networks. Um, and and then I also was listening, inspired by all the differences of what what people brought into it, like the different landscapes, the different the different contexts, and how it's really playing out so um, differently in in Australia, in South Africa, and how you're all wrestling with different different challenges. But then in the end, there are also some commonalities, and I hope this event and also the learning journey was was really helpful for you as the as the landscapes. Um, I'd like to deepen that reflection and and also connect it with yeah some like practical things that that we can do and and this part is actually also moving us into setting intentions like what are our next steps um, in our as a group but then also of course in your respective projects and your respective landscape so as you're listening um, to me also reflect on um, what kind of intentions, what kind of next steps uh, seem viable and inspiring uh, to you. So I will share my screen here. And um, something that came up again and again, I think SERP spoke to this quite clearly. Um, I think a lot of organizations are mistaking scaling purely for the width, you know, like how can we reach more people? How can we reach more geographies? And this is also somewhat of a capitalistic idea, right? Of this uh, faster, wider, bigger. Um, 
but width is only one dimension of how I would see scaling and also how Tim Strasser, who, who created this tool that I'm going to introduce to you, sees it. So if we're talking about the width of scaling, um, it's really about widespread and coherent influence, right? And I want to guide you through what we say like transformative impact, which seems to be the goal of most of the landscapes here and transformative impact, meaning that we're replacing some of the dominant ways of doing, for example, degenerative agriculture practices with new ways of doing like regenerative agriculture practices. And if we can institutionalize and really spread regenerative agriculture practices, we can speak of transformative impact. But to get to a transformative impact, we need capacities and we need capacities as individuals, like our abilities to you know, lead and organize our efforts. And we also need capacities as collectives, like how do we um, do things together and how do we collaborate for these larger transformative impacts? So um, in preparation, I was picking out some of the challenges, some of the ambitions of the different landscapes and Hama you were sharing that with India, you want to um, move now from two pilot sites to a much larger 200,000 hectare area, right? So this is the, the next step of your impact journey. And if you wanna do that, it's important that you build your transformative capacity and um, engage more diverse people and perspectives, you know? So you're gonna probably work with different government agencies, as you said, and also, other villages um so you need to be able to engage with these speak their language understand their needs and their goals and then to spread your um your approach but also to adapt your approach to these diverse con contexts so beyond the two pilot sites when you're going to the two hundred thousand hectares and that's really a widening um impact where you know expanding the the amount of of land you're targeting. Um, then what I heard when from the landscape of Australia is that you have a deep need and stre st uh, strategic priority, which I want to really applaud you for, to hear um, the First Nation people more and participate and like also embrace and acknowledge their practices because they've been uh, working with the land for so long. Um, but then if you're as not when your movement becomes more diverse, you know, and there's more and more people with different perspectives coming in, you want to make sure to develop your capacity to build coherence across that diversity. So diversity and, and celebrating the diversity is important. And we don't have to create these monocultures. But in the end, when we want to scale impact, we also need to have a coherent mission, coherent practices. And this can lead um to your to an impact that some of your core principles um, of how you regenerate the land um become present in diverse adaptations or different um different places where you're working now as i said oftentimes we're focusing very much on these widening impacts you know because in impact reports it's just so much better to say we've reached 1 million people and like 500,000 hectares than saying we've reached a lot, bit less people. Um, but what's often then overlooked is that it's also important to look at the depth of our impact. And when depth here, the image that comes to mind, and I think that most of you are familiar with, is the this idea of the iceberg, um, right? That at the what's visible is like really events and then there's these societal structures, but at the bottom of that is some mindsets and some values um, that are currently often very degenerative of how we how we relate with the land and with people. So when we talk about the, the depth of our impact, it's really about the structural and cultural embeddedness. And this relates very much to, yeah, to cultural um, shifts and mindset shifts. So I want to loop back to what Serb has been um, sharing very clearly is that maybe instead of thinking about just the solutions, we also need to clarify and enact our core principles, you know, like justice and equity, and regeneration. What are your core principles? And how um, can you 
develop your capacity to enact those principles in order to create changes in values, norms, and behaviors, and also in the way people think about it. Something that comes up for me um, is like this the separation that we see between humanity and nature, you know, like that's that's a that, that's a worldview that humanity is separated from nature. Indigenous cultures, for example, and the people I'm collaborating with there know that we are also part of nature and we are have a responsibility to steward the land, right? So this is one concrete a mindset shift which can go very deep, actually. Then what I heard um, from from Spain, uh, from Laura, um, is that you have a need to really influence agricultural policies. Um, so really also doing some more of this political work. And this relates to changing and established institutions that are also being recognized by them. And if you want to do that, then you need to develop and the deepening capacity to challenge dominant power structures. Because if you want to you know, change policies, you need to, I think you were mentioning also that there's this large influential group, right? Which is more in power than you are currently. So you need to develop your capacities to really crack that open and see where is power centralized and how can you, how can you work with that and how can you shift that as well. And the last um, deepening capacity an impact I want to mention is again in, Aus in Australia. So Keith, what you've been sharing, um, you know, once you engage more with first people's um, nations, you're going to have these difficult conversations about the history, right? And there it's important to build your capacity to understand and problematize root causes and, you know, imperialism and colonialization being one of the root causes and also to develop your capacity to reconcile and heal trauma. Like when we go into trauma, then it gets really, really deep. And there's of course, personal trauma, but there's also interpersonal and collective trauma. And when you engage with First Peoples Nations, um, a lot of that is coming out. Um, so you need to develop your capacity to kind of be with that and, and heal. And again, this can lead to a deepening to a depth impact of changing changing in power relations which have been established for for centuries uh, in Australia and really giving first uh, first people's nation more of a voice uh, seat at the table so this is um the deepening capacities and for me that's definitely part of scaling because the moment you go really wide eventually you lose track of what was the initial motivation and what were some of the worldviews that you really wanted to change. So that's something to keep in mind. And then lastly, there's the lengthening uh, capacity. So this is how can you evolve your work over time? How can you make it stronger uh, and continuous over time? And again, Keith, what you've been sharing is it's important for you to build trust over long periods, which is amazing. Trust is essential for collaboration. And this will enable you to um, ensure resilience when there's uh, challenges coming up. And the length impact here is that you really manage to persist over the long run and like people continuously engage um, because you have this foundation of trust. So that's a very important uh, lengthening capacity. And then the last part um, from the from the Netherlands, what what you've been sharing, Matthias, specifically about your tool, this tool, this compass, um, really helps farmers to shape their goals and their strategies, right? So they, they can assess where are they at and then create new goals and strategies, and this also helps them and their work to mature along developmental um, stages of their work. So that's a very great lengthening capacity that you've already built. And um, through that, you'll be able to increase the width and the depth of your impact um, over time. So this is the full picture, right? So if, if we're talking about scaling impact, I would suggest to think about it in terms of the width, the depth, and the length as well. Um, and the last part, 
before going to the intentions is then also being pragmatic about how we organize our collectives. We also need network leadership. Network leadership is more of a distributed form of leadership. It's very collaborative. It's not this heroic uh, command and control thing, but there's different roles that we need to consider when developing our, our capacities for change. Um, I'm not going to go so much in depth, but uh, but you can assess for yourself, you know, what are some of the roles that you feel most drawn to? So some of us like hosting platforms, others like to create partnerships or weave uh, knowledge together. Others are really good at providing resources, right? Like talking with founders. Um, maybe you also really like to advocate and do policy changes or evaluate, um, evaluate impact. Maybe you like to organize events or strategies, and maybe you're really focused on the relationships and your community weaver. So all of these roles are necessary in our ecosystems to develop transformative capacity and then to um, reach transformative impact. And there are many ways to go about this, and I'd love to invite you to shortly reflect and type into the chat what are some of your um, intentions for your own practice maybe it's like i want to you know increase our deepening capacity to work with trauma or i want to look into the role of an advocate and and see that so you can use this scale 3d tool also to sh sharpen your intentions and what we really want to bring out here is also a diversity of approaches. So just what you are, what's alive in you, you can type that into the chat um, and then try to implement it, you know, um, next week or something. So yeah, I'd love to see that in the in the chat. Once you've typed your intention, you can also read that of the others and like really be fulfilled by the abundance of um, of intentions to regenerate our our world together. Also, if you see anybody who shares an intention, you feel like you can help that person, you can get in touch through like a private message or an email. So you can really also support each other with these intentions if you feel like it. So yeah, there might be still intentions coming in, but um, for the sake of honoring all of our our time commitments, um, I think we can wrap it up. Um, again, I want to share my gratitude for the team also of putting together such an inspiring session and bringing on the mountain trail and my gratitude for the landscapes. And of course, all of you participating and sharing your advice. Um, we're in a very important planetary moment and a very important um, stage of our evolution as a species. And we're now called to step up and to collaborate and create 
a next phase of our evolution, which is again more in harmony with Earth as a living being and with all species, animals, and, and plants. And um, I'm grateful that we can do that together and that all of us here in this room are dedicated to this work to co create a more thriving world for all. So um, let's go ahead and let's do the work and uh, enjoy the path as well. Take good rests and um, yeah, do it in a way that comes natural and that creates more beauty and more thriving in the world. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Adrian. I have nothing to add. This, this was uh, really wonderful. We will share uh, after the... After today, we'll share the recordings of the main sessions and the slides of SERP and also some resources from Adrian um, and some of the things you also shared in the chat and in the Google Doc. So you will get a whole um, follow up from this. Um, just a very practical thing. Uh, we This session today was also part of our community of practice sessions of the Four Returns community. And next month, we have another one coming. Milena, do you want to tell us a little bit about it? And that's how we uh, just close up today. Sure. Um, so next month on December 22nd, I think that's a Thursday in the um, afternoon uh, in uh, yeah, Amsterdam time. Uh, we will have a uh, four turns reflection session where we will uh, use uh, um, methodology um, from uh, Theory U to reflect a little bit on where we are at the moment um, in, in our personal lives, but also where we are currently um, in our landscapes to figure out uh, yeah, how we can how we can move forward and uh, create uh, the change that we want to see. So um, this is it's going to be a very low key session, but um, we will also use a journaling um, a journal we will be journaling uh so it will be more uh, offline and intimate but uh yeah so we keep the work going also with the inner work that we all of us need to do and that's connected to the building of capacity that uh, adrian mentioned as well thank you everybody uh, so much for being here today for um supporting each other collaborating sharing sharing ideas in your stories and we'd love to see you next time uh, in our community of practice sessions. Have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.